Dear all, welcome to all again. I'm very proud to have uh, with us today Professor Rafael Charzan of Jagiellonian University in Krakow and uh, on behalf of Ernie Eurogen and Omninet and International Federation of Spina Bifida and uh, our trans -earn working group between Eurogen and Ithaca, I welcome to all. This is the seventh webinar that uh, we are going to have on spina bifida and urological management. And today, the webinar will be uh, focused on the first line management. The first line doesn't mean uh, something not important because we know very well that the correct management in the first line is able to avoid a lot of concern and complication on these patients. So welcome to all and uh, Professor Zimak, please. Вітаю, шановних учасників українських. Вітаю вас на сьомому на сьомому вебінарі із цілої серії вебінарів, присвячених спінальним дезрафізмом. Як пригадаю вам, що ця серія вебінарів організована спільно із Європейською референсною мережею Євроджен, Міжнародною федерацією спіни біфіди та гідроцефалії та Міжнародним благодійним фондом Омнімережа для дітей за підтримки Європейського товариства дитячих урологів. Хочу нагадати декілька технічних моментів. Кожен, хто відвідує вебінар онлайн, отримає сертифікат участі. Учасники також мають можливість отримати один бал міжнародної акредитації, якщо вони заповнюють опитування по закінченню вебінару. Ті, хто пройшов опитування, отримають сертифікат з міжнародним балом орієнтовно через три тижні після закінчення вебінару. Маємо ще специфічне оголошення для української аудиторії. У разі повітряної тривоги просимо вас негайно перейти в укриття. Перегляд запису вебінару та відповіді на питання будуть доступні згодом. І сьогодні маю велику приємність спільно із комодератором, професором Джованні Мосієло, якого ви знаєте як керівника комплексного операційного блоку хірургії та нейроурології у дитячій лікарні Бамбіно Джезу у Римі, президента Італійського товариства дитячої урології, голову робочої групи Спіна Біфіда Європейської референсної мережі Євроджента і така, а, а також нашого шановного сьогоднішнього спікера, професора Рафала Тшана, керівника кафедри дитячої урології Ягелонського університету у Кракові, Польща, президента Польської асоціації дитячої урології. Прошу. Пане Мусієло. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Announced today, we are very proud to have with us Professor Rafal Charzan. Professor Rafal Charzan is a pediatric urologist. He is working in Krakow, in Poland, and is professor in Jagiellonian University. And uh, his activity was always focused on the pediatric urology and mainly on the mini-invasive treatment. He was a pioneer of the laparoscopic procedure, used in every uh, kind of surgery, especially in reconstructive urology. He also is uh, uh, the general secretary of the European Board of Pediatric Urology and is involved in the Eurogen. For his role in the, the FEAPU, in the, the training of the fellows of European Society of Pediatric Urology that uh, every year and is able to degree specialists and is very focused uh, in training for training people for education and for this reason I believe that uh, his presence today with us will be very useful and uh, for all because uh, he's uh, 
acti daily activity is focused on training people for becoming pediatric urologists. And for this reason, welcome to Professor Rafael Charzal. Dr. Zima, please. Шановне товариство, сьогодні ми будемо мати приємність почути вебінар, лекцію на тему лікування першої лінії, чиста періодична катетеризація та антихолінергічні засоби, яку для нас підготував професор Рафал Хжан. Прошу, пане професоре, Хжан. The floor is yours. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Rafał Szan. I'm a pediatric urologist working in Krakow, Poland. And it's a great pleasure and a big honor for me to give you a talk on first-line management in patients with spinal dystrophism. Uh, the lecture is a part of the European-Ukraine webinar series on spinal dystrophism. I have no disclosures regarding this topic. My talk will go as follows. After a very brief introduction, I would like to present the uh, general rules of the initial management. Then I will go through the pharmacological treatment uh, of the bladder and I will put special attention on the clean intermittent catheterization. I'm not going to discuss the continuous antibiotic prophylaxis as it was already discussed in the previous lectures. Definitions are very important and we really know that we are talking about the same things in the same way. That was also the goal of the standardization document that was published by the International Continents, the Children Continents Society. So when thinking about uh, this function of the bladder and sphincter, recall this um, group of problems with one term, which is lower urinary tract dysfunction, which can be subdivided into two groups, neurogenic and non-neurogenic and avoiding and storage symptoms related to this function of the lower urinary tract are called lower urinary tract symptoms. And of course, we all realize that many of those patients sh will show up with, with bowel problems. So when we discuss uh, these two topics together, we call this issue bladder and bowel dysfunction. We have already learned that the prevalence of spinal dystrophies is one to four per 1,000. And uh, we all know that more than 90% of all those patients will show up with urological problems, which is called neurogenic lower nerve tract dysfunction. What are the urological issues that require our attention? So, um, Recurrent urinary, uh, urinary tract infections and vesicoureteral reflux, if untreated or treated not in the right way, then can lead to renal impairment. Another big issue for those patients is the quality of life, which is directly related to um, urinary incontinence and sexuality. And we also have to keep in mind that we have to um, deal with consequences of the major surgical reconstruction that have been done in the childhood. The diagnosis of spinal dysrhythm can be made during the prenatal screening. Just after birth, it could be also very straightforward. However, some patients will show up later during the life with bowel and bladder dysfunction. And then the throughout physical examination is mandatory, including the lumbar spinal region to look for this signs of a possible spinal dysrhythm. What's very important, almost all children 
with spinal dysrhythm are bored with normal renal function. If they are born with normal kidneys, why is it so important to keep an eye on them from, uh, from the very beginning? So when we look back into the literature, and then we will try to follow the patients with spinal dysrhythm that have been born uh, in the 60s and 70s of the last century, we can see that 50% of them will never reach the adulthood and one third of those group um, will die before because of renal impairment. Fortunately, everything has changed. And nowadays, more than 90% of all patients born with spinal dysrhythm will reach adulthood. So why the prognosis for those patients is much better nowadays? It's because we all know that we need to keep an eye on them from the very beginning in a very regular way. So we need to follow the recommendations and guidelines that have been proposed by the experts from the different societies, as well as the patients' organizations. But still, we have to keep in mind that the guidelines are not everything, that every patient is different. And sometimes, if we don't know how to treat them, we should talk to the other colleagues, talk to the patient to find the best way to help them. During my talk, I will mainly refer to the guidelines of the European Society for Pediatric Urology. However, I would recommend to all of you this very good article that has been published last year. You will find there, uh, it's a very clear article and you can find them there the summary of different guidelines and recommendations. In the previous talks, we have learned that there was neurodynamic classification of uh, neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction depending on the detrusor and sphincter activity. And the worst case scenario, the worst case clinical scenario is uh, detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. Unfortunately, probably 70% of all patients with spina bifida uh, will present with the trusor sphincter dyssynergia. And what's even worse, the pattern of the bladder and sphincter behavior can change very much, especially during the first years of life. That is why it's extremely important um, to start the proper assessment of the lower urinary tract, as well as the proper management from the very beginning. So on a regular basis, the uh, ultrasound of the kidney and the urinary tract must be done. And the first urodynamic study must be done during the first months of life. Um, if you are not lucky enough to be able to do a fluoroscopy at the same time, and VCUG, and cystography, has to be done, especially in patients with um, dilation of the upper urinary tract and also the general assessment of the renal function must be done on a regular basis. For those patients, also general rules of the treatment of lower urinary tract dysfunction must be applied. So all of them will need urotherapy. The standard urotherapy means proper intake, proper emptying of the bladder. And for the majority of them, proper emptying of the bladder means clean intermittent catheterization. Some patients will need pharmacotherapy. Some of them, few of them, will require surgical treatment of the bladder, of the bladder outlet, or some of them uh, will be given in uh, catheterizable uh, channels. And one has to keep in mind that bowel function must be also assessed and properly managed from the very beginning. CIC is directed toward functional infravesical obstruction, and it's done in order to save the upper urinary tract and the renal function. So CIC is mandatory 
in patients with detrusive sphincter dyssynergia, with those with high pressure reflux and recurrent urinary tract infections, all those patients who will be treated pharmacologically due to the drusor overactivity and poor compliance, and also in patients after major reconstructions. As mentioned before, there are two approaches that have been described in the literature, proactive one and so-called expected one. Proactive means that the clean intermittent catheterization will be started at the very beginning after birth. And in those patients, the risk for VUR is less than 10%, and only few of them will require augmentation cystoplasty later in life. When the clean intermittent catheterization has been delayed, probably more than 50% of those patients will show up with dilation of the upper urinary tract, and many of them will need augmentation um, at the end of the day. So to summarize, clean intermittent catheterization should be considered in all newborns, as the first goal is to protect the renal function without any delay. And the second thing is just to um, teach the parents and then the child to the routine of ICCS that is much easier when it's introduced uh, just after birth. So the next issue in our proactive um, treatment is pharmacotherapy that can be started from the very beginning or can be postponed until the first urodynamic investigation. However, uh, we have to start um, pharmacotherapy in all patients with poor comp detrusor compliance and high end feeling pressure. High end feeling pressure means the pressure that is more than 20 centimeters of water um, at the end of the filling and the bladder capacity should be recalculated based on the age of the patient. And uh, Antimuscarinics should be given also in all patients with the trusor overactivity and the trusor rig point pressure uh, uh, of more than 40 centimeters of water. Um, the first line treatment is oxybutamine. It's very cheap. It's easy to, uh, to calculate. Uh, it should be given uh, three times a day. Um, we have to keep in mind that the half life of oxybutynin is two to three hours. So in some patients, um, it will be better to give oxybutynin every six hours, so four times a day. Um, uh, the uh, initial dose is 0 0.4 milligram per kilogram per day, divided into three or four um, gifts. And uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't give more than 15 milligram per day. And oxybutynin could be also given intravesically. And um, in this way, we can um, limit the side effects um, or to diminish the number of side effects. And we can give more oxybutynin directly into the bladder. And the most troublesome side effect, at least at the beginning of the treatment, is constipation. On the long term, um, there are some um, clinical trials showing that there could provoke some behavioral problems. However, um, if it's necessary, antimuscarine should be started without any delay. Um, what are the alternatives to oxybutynin? It's tolterodine, it's propivirine, solifenacin. Um, my background is not antimuscarinic, but it's also I uh, use to um, diminish the infravesical pressure as well as botulin, botulin toxin. And both drugs have been approved by the FDA in 2021 for patients, for children uh, with neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction. So what is the rationale of using of those um, drugs in patients? As we all know, there are a lot of different receptors um, 
uh, in the bladder, in the bladder outlet, um, uh, which is the, uh, the bladder neck. Um, there are a lot of muscarinic receptors, different types, and different drugs works on different types of the receptors. Oxybutynin uh, is called non-selective because it works on M1 and M2 and M3 receptors. M2 receptors are the most present in the human bladder, although the other receptors are also very important uh, to modulate, uh, modulate uh, um, uh, the cooperation between these receptors. So um, solifenazin, uh, which is a very selective drug, as probably less effective. Um, my background works completely different. Um, uh, Antimuscarine drugs, they block active contractions. Uh, but agonists like my background, it acts like an uh, stimulator of um, uh, release of the uh, tension of the bladder. And of course, um, we can use the botulin toxin that works on the uh, that, that inhibits uh, the release of acetylcholine um, and uh, blocks the contraction of the of the uh, bladder. To summarize this this part of my lecture, I would like to stress that neurologic injury in spinal dystrophism is a dynamic process. So, as mentioned before, during the first year of life we can expect changes in neurodynamics of the lower night tract in 19% in of all patients. About one third of the newborns with primary normal neurodynamics um, uh, can deteriorate um, uh, during the first years of life. So regular neurodynamic investigation is mandatory to adapt the pharmacological treatment to change the um, uh, pattern of key intermittent catheterization in those patients. Now we would like to go to the next part, which is clean intermittent catheterization. I would like to discuss when, how, and by whom. Before we go further, I would like to recall the basic knowledge on the development of the lower right tract function. So the fetus voids about 30 times per 24 hours. In the neonates, the number of voiding is more or less 15 times per 24 hours. And sphincter overactivity and lack of bladder sphincter coordination is a physiological um, phase of the development of the lower nile tract function. So the sufficient bladder emptying occurs every four hours, more or less four hours during the neonatal period. We are talking about the uh, about um, neonates without any kind of neuropathy. Um, during the second and the third year of life, we will see the stepwise development of voiding control. Um, at three years of age, circa, uh, more or less 80% of all children is continent. And at the age of five, 90% will show social continence, which means voiding frequency between four to seven times a day. Clean intermittent catheterization has been introduced by Lapides in 1972 and then in, it was also um, introduced to the pediatric population by Hannigan. And um, over the years, it became a part of the standard protocol in many centers across Europe. And once again, we will start with definition. Clean intermediate catheterization means clean. It's not sterile. So um, from the very beginning, we have to teach parents and the caregivers that it should be done without gloves. Um, the urethra or the external part of the urethra should be cleaned only with soap. And uh, for the medical staff, it's mandatory to use the non-sterile gloves, but it's more 
from the psychological point of view. Um, the catheters that are used, the currently there are single use sterile catheters, but in the past, from the very beginning, they, uh, the catheters were reusable, so they, uh, they were cleaned. Um, and it's also still possible in case if there is no catheter, no other way of acting. And uh, there are different ways of teaching, there are different ways of education, but which is what is very important, um, the staff and the parents and the child must be involved in the process from the very beginning. The catheters are made from different materials um, and they vary a lot in terms of their properties, stiffness, durability, tissue reaction, and so on and so on. The most common ones are made of PVC or PU. Those kind of catheters are inexpensive, but they are also quite stiff, so they are easy to use. The silicon catheters are flexible, uh, durable, uh, and they are expensive. And latex catheters, they are very cheap. However, we have to keep in mind that there are allergic reactions described, especially in the group of patients with spina dystrophies. There are different types of the catheters that are, um, are available. Uh, the most common one is the Nelaton catheter with a stride tip, and uh, we have to keep in mind that the opening is on the side, not on the top. A Timon catheter is uh, um, quite useful for boys, and uh, flexible uh, tip catheters, um, they are used only in the very special situations when there is stricture or when there is a very difficult a way to introduce the catheter and a pointed tip catheter, uh, which is also available on the market. Nowadays, there are also catheters uh, um, with coating. So we can divide the catheters into two groups, uncoated and coated. Coated means that there is a hydrophilic layer uh, directly on the catheter. So uncoated catheters, they require lubricants. So, which means that there is an additional handling, which is important for uh, those patients who require catheterization several times a day. There is a risk for irritation of the urethra, but they are easy to hold and insert, and they can be left, if necessary, for a period of time, for example, overnight. The coated hydrophilic catheters they are probably less harmful for the urethra. Um, they are probably beneficial in terms of lowering the risk for UTIs, but the literature is scarce and the, the conclusions are not very clear, especially in the pediatric population. However, those hydrophilic catheters, they are treated to steer. They are very slippery. And some of them, they need additional activation and they must not be left in the urinary tract uh, so they cannot be used as the overnight. Um, there are different size and the length of the catheters. And every size uh, has different color, which is quite easy um, uh, to be recognized by the caregivers and the patients. So the size begins from six charrier or French, which means uh, one charrier is one third of millimeter of external diameter. And they go up in the pediatric population. We usually don't use more than 20. And the length in boys is between 20 and 40 centimeters. In girls is usually 20. But there are also catheters, uh, very short ones that are very easy to steer and they are seven centimeters long. What about teaching uh, the parents and the child? Um, 
from the technical point of view, we have to realize that teaching parents skin intermittent catheterizations take, take time. So uh, we really need to help very dedicated personnel and stepwise introduction, introduction from the very beginning. We have to uh, be very patient. So it's a huge work that usually is done by the nurse. Um, the patient and the caregivers, the caregivers at the very beginning, and then the patients, they require regular reassessment. Um, it's much, it's good when one, more than one caregiver is involved. It's the patient, the child is not left um, only under uh, direct supervision of only one parent. And um, uh, when we want to start self catheterization, the cognitive and physical ability of the child must be assessed before. The second thing is the psychological and, and emotional readiness for doing catheterization. So those patients will require close follow up and support. And the puberty is a very tricky period of life. And we all know that in this specific period, the compliance with the patient will be very um, limited. So they will, they will, uh, they will need extra attention from the medical staff. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, in the proactive approach, when everybody is used to do catheterization from the very beginning, it's much easier to continue um, this through the life than when it should be learned later um, uh, during the childhood. And also the social aspects are very important. So how often and what size of the catheters should be used? Um, when we go back to the first slide of the second part of my topic and the physiology of the urinary lower urinary tract, we will recalculate this also for the um, um, uh, scheme of clean intermittent catheterization. So during the neonatal periods, so newborns and neonates, they should be um, catheterized six, at least six times a day, so every three hours, and they should be also catheterized once in the night. So usually we try to schedule this in this way that we, um, we teach parents to do the catheterization during the night feeding. And then after the first year of life, so 12 months of age and up, uh, the catheterization should be done at least five times a day. So every four hours with a night break that is not longer than eight hours. So those are the general rules, but it should be adopted according to the presence of urinary incontinence, um, uh, incidence of urinary tract infections and so on and so on. What about the size of the catheter? The thicker, the better. We should teach the parents to use thicker catheter. Um, uh, it, it's safe and it allows to empty the bladder within the um, reasonable time. So we will start with six and eight in the neonatal period, eight in girls, six in boys, and then we will go up after the first uh, during the second year of life and uh, and then uh, in adolescence we use 14 and 16 uh, uh, french catheters so the urethra is the most common way to introduce the catheter and um, Teaching parents can be a little bit tricky at the very beginning, so there are special tools that can be used for that. Uh, the female and male model uh, to teach, to show, and to teach catheterization. Um, for self catheterization, the uh, a special mirror can be used uh, uh, in girls to enable them to localize the urethra. As we said before, urethra is the most obvious way of emptying of the bladder. But in some cases, uh, it's difficult or 
impossible to do catheterization via the urethra and then we have to or we should be able to offer uh, uh, so-called catheterizable channels or stomas to those patients. So the indications for uh, doing a stoma uh, are as follows. One is difficult to introduce the, cat the catheter via the urethra in patients with severe deformities, obesity or urethra stenosis. And the second group of patients are those who would like to have better quality of life, those who would like and are able to achieve independence by doing self-catheterization. The most popular channel uh, is uh, stoma according to Mitrofanov. So for this uh, type of uh, channel, the appendix is used. Um, so if you are lucky enough and the appendix is long enough, um, we would like to put the opening of the stoma into the umbilicus. Just before the surgery, the, mar the, uh, the place of the stoma must be marked, umbilicus or the alternatives, because we don't know how the appendix uh, would look like during the surgery. The appendix is mobilized, um, uh, is transected at the base, and then one part of the appendix is affixed to the bladder and the other end is put in the umbilicus. And it looks like this after operation. If there is no appendix or if the appendix is too short, we can, um, can make the tube uh, using part of the intestine. Um, uh, there will be uh, like an two and a half centimeter long segment of the intestine needed to perform uh, a so-called Monty tube. So you can see here there is an uh, ileum and there is here part of the ileum uh, resected with preservation of the blood supply. If this fragment is too short, then we can take another one and we can make a uh, so-called double Monty uh, to very long tube. So um, to prevent the most common problem, which, which is uh, stenosis at the level of the skin, the catheter should be left inside in situ for five to six weeks after the surgery, and then for several months, the so-called ACE stopper can be used in those patients. It's like a silicon cork in different length that has that that is put into the stoma to prevent stenosis and and to reach the re final results as presented in this picture. Unfortunately, there is a high uh, risk of problems, complications um, with this uh, kind of alternative channels to empty the bladder. So the most common one is probably the bleeding, trash and bleeding from the stoma. And for those patients, uh, usually expectative approach is applied. So the catheter is left just for a while, for 24 hours, uncoated catheter, and then it will stop and then the, uh, the uh, catheterization can be resumed. And um, in some patients, uh, stenosis, uh, will occur usually at the level of the skin that might require surgical treatment, endoscopic or open. Um, usually it's a minor surgery. However, um, up to one third of the patients will require that. And leakage um, that uh, can be very annoying, uh, sometimes difficult to treat, will occur uh, in more or less 15% of the patients. And of course, we need to realize that in many of those patients, the wound healing is a little bit more difficult than, the, uh, than in, let's say, um, and the other groups. Um, so very often we have just to be very patient. If the appendix or the multi tube is intact, we should just wait 
and wait and leave the catheter. Um, to summarize uh, my talk, I would like to stress that proactive approach according to the guidelines is nowadays recommended. This to protect the upper tract and the renal function uh, and is done by means of clean intermittent catheterization and pharmacotherapy. Um, this proactive approach should also prevent the recurrent uh, urinary tract infections. The regular follow-up um, is also highly recommended in all patients by means of urodynamics, by means of ultrasound, and a clear assessment of the renal function. And the frequency of this follow-up depends on the clinical course and the age of the patient. And the proper bowel management should be started, should be a part of this in initial urological uh, management of all patients with spinal dysraphism and urogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction. And the quality of life is extremely important as we um, all know nowadays that those patients, the majority of them, we are rich adulthood. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rafal. Thank you very much for your very, very complete presentation. And first, to start with the discussion of today, I would like to remember you that if you wish to ask a question regarding the presentation today, you can do so by typing into the question box and we will try to answer now. We have just received some questions and uh, I don't know who have time. Anyway, the question will be addressed on the, uh, we will receive an answer on the next, during the next webinar and will be uh, included in the, our website. Uh, at this purpose, I would like to remember that in the, the previous webinar, we had a long discussion with a lot of questions and, of course, an answer. So, in order to avoid to take time for the discussion of today, we included the answer to the previous webinar only in, the, uh, uh, in uh, our website, and you can find all the answers that uh, you, uh, you have done, so the question you have done in the previous webinar. And uh, uh, compliments to Professor Rafal because uh, uh, very complete, and we have uh, some questions, and uh, if you agree, I would like to start uh, with uh, this, and uh, because uh, uh, First of all, and uh, there is a question uh, regarding the best way to determine the time interval between intermittent catheterization and uh, if there is a connection with the age. And I've seen that you explained that in the, during the presentation, but could be so kind to answer now, please, Professor Rafal. Uh, scene. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni, for your nice comments. And yes, um, I think we have already addressed the first question during my talk. So it's really depending on the uh, on the age of the patient, and so we need to follow the physiological development of the uh, lower urinary tract, which means that we want to catheterize children, newborns, and the neonates. A um, little bit more often, so six times a day. Um, it's very wise to do this once uh, uh, during the night. And um, from the second year of life up, we uh, normal schedule includes four, five times a day, every four hours. And then uh, the night break should be more or less eight hours. But it also depends on the on the bladder capacity. So in some patients, the bladder capacity is a little bit lower. It's not, let's say, the bladder is not big enough for the age. Then you can consider and discuss with the patient, and the, which is very important, the compliance is uh, good. So the pressure is not too high at the end of the 
uh, of the uh, of the feeling, then uh, you can discuss with the patient to do the catheterization a little bit more often, like every three, three hours. But the standard way is five times a day, every four hours, and eight hours long break during the night. Thank you very much. Very, very clear. And uh, what about the second question and uh, recommended medication or combination before urodynamics? I believe that it is preferred to what to do with uh, anticholinergics and uh, uh, what do you think about that? So, um, yeah, thank you very much for this question. A very important one. I think that um, I, I, I don't really know what was the goal of this question, uh, uh, antimuscarinics or uh, prophylaxis, because there are two, two types of medication that can be prescribed before or around the urodynamics. So, as we said before, it depends on the goal of the urodynamics. If you want to assess the bladder without anticholinergic, anti, uh, antimuscarinics, let's say, then you stop them depending on the pharmaco uh, pharmacokinetics. So, as I said, as I mentioned already in my talk, uh, there is no need to stop uh, oxybutynin longer than one day before the study because uh, you know it disappears very quickly from the body. Uh, it's a little bit different with sorifenazine and uh, Myra background, for example. But oxybutynin it disappears very quickly. If we want to if we want to discuss uh, the need for antibiotic prophylaxis, it's the same like for the VD, uh, for the VCUG, uh, voiding cystiotrogram. So it depends on your local rules and regulations and, every, and, and so on. I think that uh, this is, it, it has been proven that giving antibiotic prophylaxis around the VCUG can lower the, the risk of urinary tract infection. So I think it's the same for urodynamics. And the second important thing is that we shouldn't do urodynamics when there is an, any sign of infection. So the urine must be clean. Otherwise, the urodynamic, the urodynamic uh, study, uh, invasive urodynamic study, cannot be reliable. Reliable. Thank you very much. And uh, regarding the third question, is uh, the fluid intake and the during the day, and it could be also, of course, during the night for patients that are with enteral nutrition and if there is some relationship between the frequency of a catheterization, what are your suggestions for that? Um, yeah, I think that there are two different groups. Um, I think that not so many patients with spinal dystrophies that will require uh, extra nutrition during the night. I think that the uh, nighttime polyuria uh, is a big issue in different groups of patients. Yeah. But, when, yeah, but anyway, when we are talking about neurogenic lower nerve tract dysfunction, I think if there's an, like a an regular fluid intake, which is like 50 milliliter per kilogram per 24 hours, that is the schedule we have already mentioned. And of course, if they need to, or if there is an, a little bit more fluid, then maybe we should adapt a little bit, I think. But it depends. You can see also, uh, on the clinical course, how often the catheterization must be done. The most important thing is the end, end um, feeling pressure. So the compliance of the blood is the most important thing. We have to stick to this. That is that is the point. We shouldn't. We should avoid extra uh, and very high pressures in the bladder. Oh, I totally agree with you, and I believe that it's very important the message that you send to us to uh, adapt to the uh, in, to, to to try to define an individual management for each specific patient. There are general rules, but then you have to take care of the single child and to adapt to the treatment. For this, I believe that it's important also to consider the situation of the caregiver and that it is specific in every case. And uh, for, the, uh, for the four question, what percentage of children require surgery? I believe that uh, is uh, something that you presented in uh, your presentation regarding the, to proactive of observational uh, treatment. Anyway, I believe that it's better to stress this topic. Yeah. Once more, thank you very much for this important question. And 
and still we need to also to to divide this question i think into several parts so when we are talking about a, a bladder augmentation so iosystoplasty for example then nowadays with the proactive proper and proactive management only few patients will require um, uh, bladder augmentation at the end of the day so which is a very good achievement of all of us over the last 20 years we know with giovanni for many years we met in utrecht when we want, uh, we discussed a lot of things together so thank you so much for that and we know that over the last 20 30 years it has changed a lot so we yeah. do not really do as much as a surgical um, augmentation as in the previous years but there are uh, different issues so the quality of life the catheterizable channels uh, which is also called the stoma uh, but that is a completely different issue so in some patients and I, I think that the number is quite quite uh, depends on your goals but it could be quite high if you want to improve the quality of life if there are any issues with transurethral catheterization they will require surgery and also the bladder neck it's also depending on the let's say social or, or the expectations of the patients uh, the social uh, let's say uh, circumstances so you can offer to them to 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 become dry but it's it's very important that you have to keep in mind that if you offer to them if they leak so if the pressure is the pressure in the bladder is low if there is a um, hypoactive sphincter and if you increase the infra um, um, the pressure in the bladder intravesical pressure because of giving them a surgical procedure to the bladder neck then it could be a risk for the uh, for the upper urinary tract and the renal impairment so be sure that they will follow the regulations uh, regarding the clean intermediate catheterization before offering to them uh, any kind of bladder neck surgery thank you very much and we are going to the end. We have only other three questions, maybe. <laughs> and the question about the management of very difficult patients with complete urinary incontinence. So what is your opinion? What is the role of the uh, interm clean intermittent catheterization in this patient that, of course, requires something more than anticholinergic? Please yeah i think that we have just addressed the topic a little bit um so uh, complete urinary incontinence means for the for uh, these patients that means that there is a hypoactive sphincter or a hypoactive uh, sphincter mechanism so um you can offer them the whole spectrum of treatments but before you go for the surgical intervention you have once more you have to be sure that they will follow the rules of the cic and so that I, I mentioned this also in my talk that our um, let's say our policy and that is what we have learned for many years is to start clean intermittent, intermittent catheterization in all patients from the very beginning, which means that we they they know how to live with that. So even if they are five, six year old years of age, and then you want to give them bladder neck surgery because of complete urinary incontinence, they will keep going with clean intermittent catheterization. If it hasn't been done from the very beginning, it will be it might be very challenging to teach the parents to convince them that it's necessary and without good schedule you shouldn't do anything to um, uh, to treat incontinence it might be very risky thanks and one question by myself and there is a time for starting self-administered catheterization do you suggest the school of age or what is your suggestion for this I think it's pretty much the same. So from we could. It depends on the on several things. So 
it depends on the manual skills of the child. Yeah. That depends on the motivation of the family because it might require extra attention from the parents at the very beginning. But if they are, let's say, if they are skillful enough, you shouldn't wait too long. So if they are able to do is to do the, the self-intermediate catheterization from the age of six, just do it. But please keep in mind that they should, that the parents should can I keep an eye on them. Yeah. Thanks for the suggestion. Uh, last question. There is a technical question for the management of the stomach of the channel, and which kind of catheter do you suggest? Uh, coated or no coated catheters? Uh, it depends. So for, let's say, for intermittent catheterization through the stoma, you can use the same catheters, I mean, coated or uncoated. As I can see here the question about leaving the catheter overnight um, in the stoma. So why we shouldn't use the coated catheters? Because the, the, the layer, the hydrophilic layer can stick so it uh, it, 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 it gets dry very quickly and it sticks to the mucosa of the stomach and also to the urethra. So we should use the uncoated catheters and then with the jelly as usual, but we shouldn't use the hydrophilic catheters to leave them overnight. Please keep in mind. Thank you. Very, very clear message. And the last two very short questions. The first one is related to if you have any experience uh, or suggestion for the use of cannabinoids? No, I have no experience no. about yeah. that. No, yes, I don't have, and uh, I don't have for this specific patient. These uh, uh, cannabinoids are more used for the uh, cerebral palsy patients and for patients with a different kind that is. Uh, Overactive bladder, and uh, but uh, no, if you need to uh, perform catheterization to treat uh, dysenergia, I believe that there is uh, no experience, uh, the standard, standardized experience with evidence-based medicine data. And the last question is the, regarding the use of combination anti-muscarinics. Do you recommend in some cases, or do you believe that it's better to shift? To another uh, uh, medication in case of no response. Um, yeah, thank you for these questions. I don't know any clinical trials mm -hmm. to yeah. prove that, but we all know that it works. So usually yeah. we use oxybutynin, and then above that we uh, we can give them solifenacin, and there is a very good option to com uh, to combine antimuscarinics and uh, beta mimetics, so my yeah. background with, because there is completely different way of action. So uh, you, we, we can combine them and once more, um, if you are able of, if you are lucky enough to have any kind of oxybutynin that can be administered uh, intravesically and combined as with solifelatin or orally or my background, every option is good to preserve the renal function and to improve the quality of life. Thank you very much. Very, very clear. I believe that we have uh, uh, no more time for other questions. Anyway, if someone would like to send us, and please send, and we will answer uh, with the Professor uh, Charzan and on the next meeting, and uh, we'll present. And uh, thanks, and Dr. Zimak, if you have any comments, we have uh, these, uh, we are at the Yes, I leave the podium to Dr. Zimak and uh, thanks to again to Omninet that helped to us to, uh, to organize this series of webinar. And uh, uh, Omninet is supporting Ukraine children with the spina bifida. And uh, so please consider uh, all donations are welcome, of course. I believe that you could understand the situation uh, that uh, uh, these children are living now with all the difficulties of the war, and uh, there is a special need for catheter and for cerebral shunt. Thanks, Professor Rafal Charzan. Thanks again.
and uh, Dr. Simak, please, and uh, the podium is yours. Yeah. Dear Professor Chan, thank you very much for your understanding pr presentation, and thank uh, to Professor Masiello uh, for your active and very useful discussion. And for our Ukrainian audience, uh, the наших українських учасників, uh, відповіді цю активну uh, дискусію ви можете переглянути на YouTube і заодно перевірити, використовуючи субтитри, заодно перевірити своє знання англійської мови. Uh, я також хочу підкреслити uh, про ініціативу Омні мережі, розпочату для підтримки дітей із пенальними uh, дезрашіями. Оскільки всі прекрасно розуміють, що е, ситуація, війна в Україні, е, вона фактично є подвійною від, війною для наших орфанних пацієнтів. І ініціатива із забезпечення наших маленьких пацієнтів катетерами для здійснення періодичної е, катетеризації сечової, це є прекрасна ініціатива, до якої ми закликаємо долучитися всіх, хто бажає. Допоможіть нам допомогти їм. Дякую ще раз нашим шановним спікерам. Пане Мусієло, the floor is yours. Yeah. No, thanks to all. Thanks again, Professor Rafal Chazan. Very, very complete presentation. Thanks to Dr. Dima. And thanks to all the organizers. And special thanks to our support technician and from the Russian. And uh, the next uh, webinar will be the 21 of March and will be held by Professor Michael Maternick from Dansk and Professor Giovanni Montini and from the University of Milan. And uh, the webinar will be focused on both nephrologists of the, uh, how to preserve the renal function and to uh, uh, integrate the uh, nephrologist at work and in this patient that is very precious because as the professor Rafael Sardan uh, remember to us and this patient until a uh, very uh, short time ago they uh, were suffered very uh, often of chronic renal failure and uh, but un still now we have uh, to preserve the renal function so the appointment is for the 21 of March. Thanks again to all. Thanks. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. До нових зустрічей на наступному вебінарі.